Developmentally Appropriate Coping in the ICU by Kate Heiler. Hi, my name is Kate Heiler and I'm a Certified Child Life Specialist in the Cardiac Intensive Care Unit at Boston Children's Hospital. I'll be talking about Developmentally Appropriate Coping in the Intensive Care Unit. In this presentation, I will provide a brief overview of the role of the Child Life Specialist and discuss Developmentally Appropriate Coping in the Intensive Care Unit. I'll discuss the importance of play for patients in an ICU. I'll provide examples of coping strategies and behavioral distraction techniques for infants through the adolescent age. And I'll provide suggestions for incorporating child life skills into your daily practice to increase the coping abilities of patients and families. Role of a Child Life Specialist. A certified child life specialist is a clinician who assists children in managing and understanding their healthcare experiences while optimizing child development and minimizing adverse effects. A child life specialist has a minimum of an undergraduate degree in child life and family studies, child development, psychology, or a related field, and is certified through the Child Life Council. Child life specialists are found throughout a variety of healthcare settings, including inpatient and outpatient hospital units, primary care clinics, emergency departments, dental offices, hospice programs, funeral homes, and critical care settings. Child life interventions facilitate coping and adjustment under circumstances that might otherwise be overwhelming. The roles of the child life specialist, specifically in an ICU environment, will range depending on the needs of the child and family. One of the roles is to provide preparation for procedures using developmentally appropriate language. Preparation can come in a variety of ways, including visual, using photos or pictures, verbal, explaining the process step-by-step -step using developmentally appropriate language, and through play, such as the patient playing doctor and giving medicine to a stuffed animal to act out what he or she will need to do. Child life specialists also provide procedural support through the use of coping strategies and behavioral distraction techniques. Child life specialists are present during procedures to focus only on the patient and can provide distraction support by using visual aids, breathing techniques, comfort measures, or diversional talk. Child life specialists provide support to siblings by assisting with facilitating visits, providing education, offering ways to feel more connected, especially when they are not able to visit, and providing parents with language to use when talking with their children. Another role of the child life specialist is to provide opportunities for developmental play and to normalize the environment. Play for all ages helps to normalize the environment, making it more like home, therefore making the hospital less scary. Child life specialists help to provide behavioral support by creating weekly schedules, daily routines, and incentive charts. A schedule or routine allows patients an understanding of what is expected of them. This can help take away some of the fear and anxiety of the unknown that being hospitalized brings. Child life specialists encourage patients and families to participate in legacy building activities. Children can be hospitalized for long periods of time. Therefore, celebrating holidays and marking special milestones can help to provide positive activities to focus on, as well as to personalize experiences for patients and families. Child life specialists can provide bereavement support for the entire family. This is done through memory-making activities such as hand and footprints, as well as providing resources and comforting items at end of life. Special programming including music therapy, school tutoring, clown visits, pet therapy, volunteer interactions, and artists are coordinated by child life specialists. Lastly, I'd like to stress that this is a team approach. Child life specialists collaborate with, educate, and share information with all members of the multidisciplinary team to best support each individual patient and family. In hospitals that do not have certified child life specialists, these roles can be performed by psychologists, physicians, and nurses, along with other members of the multidisciplinary team. Coping in the ICU. While admitted to an intensive care unit, there are many factors that can affect how a child is able to deal with stressful situations. These factors include the language that is used, the procedure itself, positioning of the patient, and the atmosphere of the room. When talking to and preparing patients, it's important to use language that they will understand. You'll need to take into account the developmental level of the patient as well. Next, think about what kind of procedure is going to be performed. Is it potentially painful, or could the patient perceive it as painful? 
Has the patient or the patient's family had a negative experience to this type of procedure in the past? Positioning is another factor that, that can affect how a patient is able to cope in an intensive care unit. Consider the position from the child's perspective. Is the patient lying on their bed, sitting in a chair, on their parent's lap, or being swaddled? When able, offer the patient or family the choice to help them feel more in control and empowered. Another factor that can affect how a child will cope is the overall atmosphere in the room. Reducing external stimuli can also help reduce anxiety. Look around the room prior to procedure. Is it too bright, too loud? Are there more staff members than necessary? Reducing external stimuli can also help reduce anxiety. These are all important factors to consider when taking care of any patient in the ICU. Next, I will talk about coping with procedures. All patients are different and therefore the coping techniques used will be different for each individual child. It can be helpful to ask the patient and family what coping techniques have been used in the past. Some of the more common procedures performed in an intensive care environment include IV placements, PICC line placements, EEGs, phlebotomy labs, tracheostomy changes, chest tube removals, x-rays, extubation, echocardiograms, and dressing changes. It's important to note that coping doesn't only happen during a procedure, such as one that I just mentioned. Coping with a procedure happens before and after as well. Often anxiety will increase during the time leading up to a procedure. This is a time of anticipation for patients and their family. Use this wait time to provide developmentally appropriate preparation as well as to continue building a trusting relationship with patients and their families. Coping continues to take place after a procedure through positive praise. It's important to provide praise even when the procedure was unsuccessful or if the child did not cope in an optimal way. Each patient copes the best they can at the time given the situation. By providing praise, you are increasing cooperation, decreasing anxiety, building trust, and giving the patient a sense of control so that the next attempt may be more effective. Being hospitalized in an ICU can be difficult for patients, and here are a few of the reasons why. Patients are isolated while hospitalized, especially those in an ICU as they can rarely leave their room. Patients are typically in pain and not feeling well. This can make it difficult to focus on anything else. Non-pharmacological pain management techniques such as distraction, deep breathing, guided imagery, and positioning for comfort can assist with coping. Patients are separated from family, friends, pets, and familiar objects that are comforting and typically surround them when at home. Changes in routine make it difficult to cope with hospitalization. Children of all ages rely on their routine for structure and to be able to anticipate what will happen throughout their day. When children are in the hospital, their routine is changed dramatically. The loss of familiar structure or routine can increase their anxiety. Patients have little control over what is happening to them while in the hospital. This gives them a fear of the unknown, which can be frightening for children. Lastly, patients are going through many tests and procedures while hospitalized. Even what may seem like a minor test to you or me can be very scary for children of any age. Importance of play. Now that we've talked about why coping can be difficult, we can discuss why play is important for children in the hospital. Children often use play to cope with pain. Play is both familiar and reassuring for children. It helps to make the hospital experience less intimidating, more comfortable, and easier to cope with. During play, children are able to continue to progress in their developmental skills. Play also makes the hospital environment more normal. This can be seen in pretend play or even in older patients who are connecting with friends on phones or computers. Often, younger patients enjoy playing with medical supplies. This helps them become more familiar with equipment and explore what it is being used for, therefore making them less frightened. Play allows for a sense of mastery and the ability to complete a challenge. Some examples are board games, art projects, shape sorters, or even a long-term project such as making a photo collage or learning to play an instrument. During play, children are able to make choices and decisions, giving them control over their care. Play can decrease a child's stress and improve their ability to cope, as well as increase their self-esteem. Coping Strategies and Behavioral Distraction Techniques I will now review some age-appropriate coping strategies and behavioral distraction techniques. Here at Boston Children's Hospital, we refer to these behavioral distraction techniques as the ABCDs. These are visual aids, breathing techniques, comfort measures, and diversional talk. 
I will review these for all of the age groups, but many of them can overlap and can be adapted for various ages. Remember that if a patient has a developmental delay, a coping strategy for a younger age group may be more appropriate. Here are some examples of age-appropriate coping strategies that can be used during procedures for an infant or birth to around one year of age. Having a parent present can help keep an infant calm and relaxed. You can assign the parent a task such as singing to or touching their baby during a procedure. This can give them a sense of control while assisting with their child's care. Sucking on a pacifier and being swaddled can be comforting for infants during procedures. Listening to soft music or a parent's voice can be soothing and allows infants to feel safe. Some age-appropriate coping strategies that can be used during procedures for one to three-year-old toddlers are using distraction techniques such as blowing bubbles, looking at books, and playing with cause effect or light up toys. In addition to parental presence, a favorite toy or stuffed animal can be comforting. Positioning for comfort can help a toddler cope during a procedure. If you can give the toddler a choice such as sitting on a parent's lap or sitting up in bed, this can allow for the child to feel more in control and therefore less threatened. Using a parent to restrain a toddler or child of any age is discouraged because the parent is typically seen as someone who is safe. Three to six year olds or preschool age children are more likely to participate in distraction techniques. Preschool age children enjoy looking for pictures in a book and singing familiar songs. They enjoy being successful at games and activities such as those on a tablet or iPad. Deep breathing such as blowing bubbles, a pinwheel, or imagining candles on a birthday cake are helpful when coping during procedures. As with the other ages, positioning for comfort can assist in coping. It is helpful to offer play before procedures so that preschoolers can process what is going to happen to them. After the procedure, play can allow preschoolers to express their emotions. In addition to having a parent present and providing opportunities for play, school-age children, 6 to 12-year-olds, enjoy telling stories and talking about favorite things such as school, sports, and friends. Some school-age children may prefer to practice deep breathing techniques to relax before and during a procedure. Distraction items such as books, iPads, handheld games, and stress balls to squeeze can also be helpful. Often, school-age children prefer to watch movies to help distract them during procedures. Adolescents may benefit from detailed explanations of upcoming procedures. They need more information and more time to process what will be happening to them compared to younger children. Keep in mind that some adolescent patients may decide not to hear all of the details. Adolescents may prefer using imagery, relaxation techniques, or distraction items to cope during a procedure. I just mentioned using comfort positions as a coping strategy for all of the ages reviewed. Comfort positions allow for control during a procedure while still allowing the child to receive comfort from the parent. Comfort positions help the parent and child feel more at ease and in control. Keep in mind that laying down can be a threatening position to a child. When possible, allow the child to sit up. Typically, treatment rooms are not located within the ICU environment, so positioning during a procedure is even more important in an ICU as many of these patients rarely leave their bed. Some other advantages of using comfort positions are that fewer healthcare team members are needed. There is a greater immobility of the child during the procedure. Close physical contact with the parent is offered. The parent has an active role and can support the child in a positive way. Take into consideration the parent's level of anxiety as well as what the parent prefers and feels comfortable doing. Here are some examples of comfort holds and positions during a variety of procedures. You can see that the children in these pictures are in positions that allow them to feel safe and comforted. Tips for your daily practice. As mentioned before, doctors, nurses, clinical assistants, and other team members can utilize the same learned child life techniques to encourage developmentally appropriate coping in children. Some suggestions to incorporate child life skills into your daily practice are to build a relationship with your patient and family provide developmental support, and to normalize your patient's environment. Building a relationship with a patient and family can help to increase their coping abilities, as well as to increase their trust in you. Some suggestions to remember when caring for your patients are to get on the child's level. Maintain a position at eye level to decrease anxiety and to establish a rapport. When you stand over a patient, it can be intimidating. It's less frightening for the child when you bend or kneel down 
so that you're at their level. Use comforting touch and encouraging words when talking to your patients. Introduce yourself and your role when you enter the patient's room. Unknown people can be threatening. Try to limit the number of staff members going into a patient's room, such as during rounds, when you are able. Too many people can be overwhelming. Be honest. Even if you are afraid that being honest may increase a patient's anxiety. In the end, honesty equals trust. Make sure you give choices only when you are able. Allowing for choices gives a child some control and empowers them to cope more effectively. Avoid giving choices when choices are not an option. Remember that the type of procedure and developmental level of the patient may depend on what choices can be given. Try to avoid asking yes-no questions. If a patient responds to your question with a no and you have to continue with the procedure anyway, they will lose trust in you. For example, don't ask if a child wants to have their dressing changed. Instead, say, it's time to have your dressing changed. Do you want to help by holding the bandage or would you rather look at a book? Only make promises that you can keep. Don't lie to your patients. For example, by saying, this is the last time or this won't hurt. Instead, you can explain to patients how other children have told you the procedure feels or ask the patient to tell you how they think it feels. This gives them something else to focus on and a job to do. Show them that you care about the child by taking the time to listen. Parents know their children best and are your best source of information about the patient. Listen to what they say. Often children are good advocates and know what works best for them. This will increase a family's trust in you and improve the hospital experience. Encourage parental involvement when, when you are able. At Boston Children's Hospital, we emphasize family-centered care. In our intensive care units, we encourage parental visitation 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Parents should always be a part of their child's safe environment. Allow parents the option of participating in their child's care when possible. In addition, at Boston Children's, parents are allowed to be present during many tests and procedures, including resuscitation and at end of life. Nursing staff, social workers, and child life specialists help support parents and family members during these events. Some developmental suggestions to keep in mind when working with patients in an ICU are that regression can be normal for some children who are hospitalized. Be careful about comparing children and be sensitive to the fact that some patients may regress in their developmental skills and act younger than what is typical for them at home. Also, appearances can be deceiving. Be careful what you assume about a patient's developmental level or coping ability. Children of all ages cope differently. Talk to your patient and their parents and ask questions to determine their developmental level of understanding. Avoid medical jargon, unfamiliar words, or words with dual meanings. The language that we use can be very confusing and frightening for children. Talk to the patient using developmentally appropriate language to explain what you're going to do. Even infants will benefit from soothing voices. It's helpful to designate one person to direct and talk during a procedure. Too many people talking at once can be overstimulating and it can make it difficult for a patient to cope during a procedure, as well as it can be confusing for the team members. Provide age-appropriate preparation prior to a procedure in a timely fashion. Older children will need more time to process and ask questions than younger children. Provide praise by using positive words to encourage and guide a patient throughout their hospitalization. It's important to provide praise during and after a procedure, even in times when you feel that the patient did not cope well. This can help you attempt the procedure again, as well as during future hospitalizations. If your patient is unable to speak, you can use pictures, communication tools such as iPad apps, and other devices to help your patient communicate and feel more in control of their hospitalization. Don't wait for a communication breakdown to occur as feelings of fear, anxiety, and loss of trust will increase when patients become frustrated. Try to hold difficult medical conversations outside the patient's room. Even if you think the patient is sedated or sleeping, they may still be listening. You can help normalize the environment for patients of all ages in the ICU environment by providing opportunities for uninterrupted play. In doing this, you're allowing patients the ability to continue to progress in their developmental skills. Play for a three-year-old may include pretend play with a medical play kit and stuffed animal. Play for a 16-year-old may include video games or video chatting on a computer with their friends. You can help to decrease how isolated patients feel while in the hospital by allowing times for family and friends to visit where they can engage in activities and conversation. Encourage and allow patients a variety of ways to express their emotions. 
Routines including school tutoring and special programming such as art or music therapy will allow patients to express their emotions in a variety of ways. Along with using behavioral distraction techniques and positioning for comfort, these are all great ways to incorporate child life skills into your daily practice. Work with your team to determine the best approach to support your patients and families. Consider using your child life department and or psychosocial team members to help prepare patients for surgery and procedures and to help patients develop coping strategies to use throughout their hospitalization. You can visit Boston Children's Hospital's website or the Child Life Council's website for additional information and resources to help support your patient's ability to cope throughout hospitalization. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.